Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking. My name's Nesh Nikolic, and my guest today is Associate Professor Michael Kasimovic. His research explores how the social environment shapes the evolution of individual traits and behaviours. In this broad question, Michael has explored how access to resources in insects, animals, and humans moderates evolutionary decisions. Interestingly, Michael has worked with insects such as spiders and crickets to explore how changes in the density of males and females affects developmental decisions and the outcomes this has for how individuals perform and age. Michael's research on humans explores how evolutionary history can explain gender differences in the video games we choose to play and how this affects how we perceive ourselves and behave. I had an absolutely wonderful time talking to Michael, particularly about how humans respond to status, both perceived and actual, and how this can moderate specific behaviours. I think you're going to really enjoy this episode because it was a fantastic conversation and Michael is one of those people who's very articulate and clear with not only his thought process, but providing an understanding of his research. Enjoy. Michael, a big thank you for coming onto the show today. Absolute pleasure, Nish. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to it. Look, I'm really excited at, at, at today's topic and, and speaking with you, someone who who knows this space, you know, exceptionally well, and hopefully learning something. You know, evolution is, I think, the uh, the heart of what, at least in my world, you know, can can explain at a at a general level. You know, the acceptance model that the, there's so much of what we can think about in in the act you know model the, the the acceptance and commitment therapy model that kind of says you are who you are um and mm-hmm. uh you know so much of the bell curve can be thrown out and just says hey it doesn't matter where you lie on the bell curve you exactly. still are who you are and that's you know your norm uh and i think that always ties back to evolution so i'm really excited to, mm-hmm. to talk about evolution and how you know the social environment shapes uh, our traits, you know, and, and behaviors. Um, so, you know, I couldn't think of anyone better than, than speak with you. So, you know, thank you. And maybe we can start with how you got into this space, because I'm always curious about how how these topics, um, you know, attract yes. certain people. So how did you uh, fumble into this world? Well, I've had a, a a weird kind of pathway to get where I am today. I actually wanted to be a dentist when I first grew up and actually a pediatric dentist of all things, which I think is incredibly difficult career pathway. But uh, it was a a third year course in animal behavior that really helped me understand the world in a different lens. You know, I've watched lots of nature documentaries throughout my life and they're always really amazing, but they didn't click like that third year course. At that point, when I took that something about the animal world and why animals do the things they do just seemed to make sense. And that was really that set me down the pathway of wanting to more, wanting to know more about animal behavior, about evolution, and set me on that pathway of doing a master's and a PhD and, and, and where I am today uh, as an associate professor. So it's, um, it's amazing what can actually trigger uh, different pathways. And it's really, to listeners, it's important to be open to things, which I think uh, allows you to find that pathway that really engages you. But yeah, it was it was wanting to know more about how, what explains why animals look and behave the way they do. And I took a little bit of a different look throughout my PhD. I was really, there was a lot of knowledge about the different f- environmental factors that usually influence how individuals develop. Things like temperature, or the presence of predators, or the time of the year. We know really, really well that those different things can impact how individuals develop, and as a consequence, how they look at maturity. For example, if you know there's a lot of predators around when you're really small, it's often important to develop really quickly and mature faster so you can become an adult and mate before those predators potentially eat you. And as a consequence, you're usually smaller. So those are really well-known facts, but 
what I was really interested in was sexual selection, this idea that individuals respond to preferences from the opposite sex. And I was keen on trying to see if things like preferences can affect how individuals develop. And, and that was really what I explored throughout my PhD is what set me on my pathway to where I am now, kind of exploring the social environment. Hmm. I have a basic understanding how yeah. some of these items can can uh, show up. Having said that, um, mm -hmm. uh, most of the times they're not they're not validated. It's just something I've heard, and I don't get to validate this with with, with someone who's who's knowledgeable. Uh, would you even just maybe talk me through a little bit about how you know temperature does so, or time mm -hmm. of year, or um, maybe a little bit more on 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 predators? Um, sure. And, and and also within you know some of the uh, research within you know humans as well. I'm assuming some of this will will relate to to absolutely uh, other animals and insects and and, and the like. Uh, mm -hmm. I do have something. Uh, actually, I might raise it a little bit later about okay. when, uh, how humans develop potentially mm -hmm. uh, when there are uh, uh, risks around. Um, uh, them and, and a question around puberty um, in terms mm -hmm. of onset that uh, I'd love to validate um, uh, if, if, if that's something you've come across. But uh, maybe we could just talk broadly about some of those factors and the research that we know to date. Absolutely. So let, yeah, let's start with non-human animals and then I'd love to get into humans because that's really where my research is nowadays as well, even though I still work on non-human animals. Um, but we, like I mentioned, we don't, we know really well that things like predators can kind of trigger, uh, developmental changes. Uh, there's some really well-known studies on fish, for example, guppies in ponds that are predator free and they happen to live close to a waterfall and they get sucked down that waterfall every once in a while into another pond. So you have this really neat separation between these ponds. And often what happens is the ponds vary. They can vary in maybe the amount of light they get, for example, or the density of predators that those individuals will encounter in these different ponds. And that really kind of sets off a cascade through natural selection that ends up selecting for different traits that lead to success in those different ponds. So in the upper pond where there are no predators, for example, there's no pressures on having to mature at a specific time. So individuals will go along the same way as they always do. But in the lower pond, if there are predators, for example, that shifts how individuals end up behaving because they need to survive those predators before they can mature and have offspring. So survival becomes this really important driving force for those individuals, and they'll do whatever they need to to survive. So we'll often see variation in how individuals will respond to different traits in uh, like predators and things like that. Uh, we have variation in how big individuals are, the genes that they have, the resources, and all that variation ends up resulting in a whole bunch of variation in the individuals that exist in that environment. And then natural selection will kind of cull the individuals that don't do really well. For example, the individuals that want to grow too large, well, they'll have to survive with predators for too long and they'll be much more likely that they'll get eaten. So those genes will be removed out of the population. So all of a sudden you'll have this selection for individuals that mature more quickly. Mm -hmm. So you can see how predation in this case can kind of trigger different developmental pathways simply because those individuals end up surviving more. And we have a similar thing kind of happening in temperature. Uh, if, if that's usually kind of dictated, um, temperature for example, will moderate chemical reactions. Uh, so that does the same thing inside an individual's body. So if individuals are maturing in a much higher temperature, we have all these chemical pathways occurring and, and moving a lot more quickly in that individual, and that individual ends up maturing much more quickly. So we can see how temperature can kind of influence how individuals can develop as well. Mm -hmm. And then we also have, like I mentioned, time of the year. For example, if you mature or are born really late into the year, you're going to have to speed your development up to be able to mature in time to mate with any individuals who are available for that mating opportunity in that season. 
So it's really all about making sure you get there as quickly as you can. So time can also be a constraint that can lead to the evolution of different developmental pathways. It's so interesting just listening to you explain some of those and and trying to consider, you know, where are we going to go with time of year and, you know, the forcing mm -hmm. function being about how genetics, uh, you know, will work to ensure that you can actually mate before the next season because the next season might not come. You know, you, you might be all exactly. then or, or all sorts of occurrences could could occur. So um, it's really fascinating to to uh, hear that because I was thinking, what well, what's what's happening here? Is it, you know, light? Is it, uh, what, 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 what's doing this? And, and uh, uh, it seems like a, a, a lot of, and, you know, as, as the word uh, uh uh, somewhat in, in insinuates evolution mm -hmm. is about what is passed on because there is the the, the function of um uh, procreation and and something has to occur before then exactly maybe a little bit different with humans because we've got so much more time these days uh, but uh it certainly wouldn't have been the case you know in our um, history where where i think uh you know our life life cycle was much shorter and and absolutely uh, there were many more risks even as as um you know young children under the age of 5 i think the uh, absolutely rates were pretty pretty um uh, low and and quite horrific so mm -hmm. in many parts of the world probably still very much are yeah absolutely uh, and tell me, uh, maybe we can step a little bit into the the, the human side, where I suppose your passion lies a, a little bit more, and probably where I think most of us are are interested. Not not that it's not fascinating in, in <laughs> animals by any stretch of imagination. I, I think a lot of that says a lot about us as well, if we mm -hmm. uh, take the time to think about it. But uh, it's really nice to also hear about it as a um, you know a fellow human. Absolutely. I totally agree. Before we jump into, into humans, I wouldn't mind just giving you one more example Please. about some of the research that I've done on the social environment. And that'll tie in really, really nicely yeah, yeah. about what we'll talk about in humans. Because in humans, like, you're, like you kind of mentioned, um, humans don't encounter that same kind of variation in temperature or daylight. And our lives are a little bit longer. So those same kind of selective pressures aren't as important in humans and don't drive some of the changes that we see. But the social environment for humans varies quite dramatically. Um, and the access to resources can as well. And those are really, really interesting triggers. So before I, I get into talking about that in humans, I'd really like to talk a little bit more about my non-human research on, on the social environment, because that'll kind of prepare uh, you and everyone else to kind of understand humans a little bit better as well. So when I did my PhD, that's when I had my opportunity to come to Australia, which is where I, I found my love for uh, Australia. But I used to work on uh, redback spiders, which is, uh, I, and I also used to be arachnophobic. So it was interesting getting over that kind of hump while, while doing my PhD. Um, but redback spiders are really, really interesting for a lot of reasons. And one of those is Males and females are really, really, there's a large difference in size between males and females. When everybody thinks about a redback, they think of a female redback spider. They're quite large. They have that big abdomen with the hourglass and that red stripe. And you see them in dunnies and along fence lines and things like that. But if you look really carefully, sometimes you also see a male. And males are interesting in the species because they're quite small. They're only about one and a half percent of a female's body weight. So they really, really are individuals whose sole purpose is to find a female and mate. And they have a very short period of time to do so. So males can, uh, females can take about a year, year and a half to mature, while males take a few weeks. And that discrepancy between the sexes kind of sets up some really, really interesting challenges for both sexes and leads to some really interesting selective pressures and I'll, I'll explain some of those, which I think are the, some of the coolest ones. So for those that don't know, redback spiders are neat because males will um, hatch from an egg sac. They'll grow up on the mother's web. And when they get close to maturity, they'll fly off. They'll stick a little bit of web in the air. The wind picks them up and they settle wherever they may be. 
they have no control over where they settle. So they may settle in with a lot of females, or they may be in an area where there are very few females. So all, right away, as soon as they find some spot to settle down in, they don't know what those challenges that they're going to face uh, as they mature for over the last stage. Quite uh, a threatening scenario and isolated from effectively in Absolutely. The, in the moment they've left the mother's web, they're, uh, they're uh, in danger. They're, they're isolated. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's the that's the kind of neat thing. Once they do start searching for a female, it is really dangerous for them. And most individuals won't survive. Probably only about 10% of the males that start searching end up finding a female. So there's very, very strong selective pressure to do the right thing. And by do the right thing, I mean is be successful at finding your female. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple ways to be successful. One way is if you know a lot of females are around you, and what, by saying no, I mean you can smell them. So that's how males can actually find females. They use pheromones. Mm. So if they smell a lot of females around, their developmental system tells them to mature much more quickly. And what that means is they, on average, will develop one or two days before other males. And that may not seem like a big deal, but it gives them that one or two head, day head start. And that means they can search for females before other males do. In, in, interestingly, if we pulled that into a, a percentage capacity, one or two days uh, increase, uh, or earlier, my apologies, over a two-week period, um, is quite a significant advantage. Absolutely. Uh, uh, because all of a sudden, you know, maybe that's 10 yeah, you know, seven, eight percent. Um, you know, that which, which is uh, a lot. You know, uh, absolutely. So it's a big yeah, number, absolutely. You know. When you put it in that way, you're absolutely right. It's it, it's quite dramatic. It's like us maturing a year earlier, for example, right? Um, so the other challenge is if you know there are not a lot of females, like if you can't smell them around you, that means you're going to have to search a lot more widely to find a female. And in that case, you need a lot more energy and it's better off to be larger. So males will delay maturation to be able to get bigger and be in better body condition to have those resources to increase their success at searching. So that, that trigger, the presence and absence of females, changes how the developmental system works and changes how males look at maturity and behave at maturity, which is really, really kind of interesting. And males will also respond to the smell of other males around them. So their social environment really is kind of telling them how they should look in hopes of maximizing their success at finding a female. And that's what I think is, is really, really cool about redbacks and how I look or think about the social environment. How does information about that environment tell us what our best behaviors or traits should be to maximize our success? That is uh, absolutely phenomenal and, and 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 such interesting and fascinating information. Can I ask before we step to the next mm -hmm. uh, part? Of course. How uh, how did researchers figure this out? What was the you know do 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 you bring in the females around, the <laughs> pheromones around, and observe like what are we doing here? How how does that space work? Because that's fascinating as well. Like how how do we um design that that type of research? Yeah, so I was really, really lucky to work with a wonderful woman named Median Andrade from my PhD, and she had a whole uh, lab full of redback spiders that we would rear all the time. And I was just fascinated in the variation that we would see in females and males. I just really wanted to figure out what was going on and why we see some of that variation. And so I convinced Median that we should try this experiment, and the experiment really was rearing males either in the absence of females or in the presence of them. So you put a whole bunch of males together in a room and make sure they don't smell any females whatsoever. And that is what we argued mimicked the environment where it was really hard for males to find females or there wasn't that much to choose from. In the other environment, you just make sure there's a whole bunch of females around and those pheromones kind of are released from those females' cages and they can enter the males' cages and they can smell those females. And if you do that during those two weeks before they're mature, that really does end up triggering 
uh, that, that change in developmental pathways. So you just got to get up every day and then count how many mature males mature in each treatment. And that's what we ended up doing. That is so incredible because the <laughs> implications of the possible uh, uh, different changes that could be taking place in humans, you know, depending on on these absolutely factors that we have no idea are in play or, or um, could be affecting us, you know, on a societal level, on a mm-hmm. um, you know global level. Uh, is is mind boggling because something mm-hmm. like this is so uh, uh, integral to how, as you say, how someone, you know, how how a red back, red back matures, mm-hmm. uh, and gosh, that then also means what does the rest of your life look like? Um, you know, absolutely survival rates, and I, I imagine if we could look into the personalities of of, of red back maybe have a absolutely uh, their, their traits develop as well and, and personalities and therefore you know um the decisions they make or the behaviors that they show the um you know the the questions are endless i'm blown away i'm blown away <laughs> absolutely since then we've looked at lots of things like behavior like you mentioned and personality even physiology and all those things end up changing their their boldness changes the their metabolic rate changes and all just from a really really simple signal and you're absolutely right that's when i really started thinking about how could this potentially be applied to humans and you're right there's a fascinating number of ways that we can kind of use this information to understand why we as humans do the things that we do as well and that's what that's what a lot of my research explores nowadays Wow! Wow! And when, when, what year did you uh, 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 do do this particular experiment? <laughs> it seems like a lifetime ago nowadays, but it's it, you know sometimes it feels just like yesterday. But it was in two between two thousand and two and two thousand and seven when I ran those experiments. After since then, uh, I did a postdoc in Australia where I worked on crickets to kind of explore a similar question using sound. And the calls that males make rather than the smells that females make and very very similar behaviors in crickets as well where both males and females alter their developmental trajectory in response to what they hear prior to maturity which gives them a real clue about their competitor uh, the number of competitors they'll be able to encounter when they mature this is incredible this is incredible so it, it definitely was a lot of fun um it allows you to tease apart uh, behaviors and, and and decisions that animals make in a level that you couldn't before. And it is kind of interesting just to kind of explore those kinds of things and take some time to understand what animals are doing. And where, where is this, this research, you know, led to mm-hmm. what have been the next steps? What has then, I suppose, sparked your curiosity? What have you worked on? I'm assuming, you know, you've, you've read um, infinitely into, into all the other research uh, as well, where are we kind of going from from this th- 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 this point? Obviously, moving toward mm-hmm. today. So the other thing that was really an important part of my life when I was younger, believe it or not, were video games. You know, I'm uh, that generation that grew up around Atari and Commodore sixty four, and I remember all the wonderful times I had with my friends playing on all those gaming systems. The interesting thing about video games is. It is a way for individuals, and when I say individuals here, I mean humans, to interact at a really, really interesting scale, especially nowadays. Video games have changed so dramatically with multiplayer games and mobile games, and people can play at any time and anywhere and and interact with people all over the world. And when I thought about that, I thought that video games were a really interesting medium to kind of explore really similar things in humans because we can moderate the challenges humans encounter in video games. We can see their performance. We can moderate who they interact with. We can see how positive and negative interactions online can influence individual behaviors. So it's this way of manipulating the social environment or observing how the social environment affects individual behavior to kind of get a better understanding of why humans do the things that they do and believe it or not it's really really similar to redbacks and crickets 
I I had a uh, scary thought before you spoke about video games, thinking, are we going to start talking about Tinder? Love <laughs> <laughs> that. Yeah, that's one thing I don't have much experience about, thankfully. Uh, so, so, so video games obviously provides mm -hmm. an opportunity at a very early stage um, and at any stage as well uh, for quite intense uh, uh connections to to be mm -hmm. and please apologize i want to apologize for my naiveness no. because i've uh when i played they were very much me as being sonic the hedgehog and playing yes. the computer at no stage did i uh, tip over to the other side but i imagine if i did have the online uh version experience i would have been sucked into that vortex because it's yeah. so powerful the way that you know, makers and have made it a lot absolutely of psychologists and incentivizing um you know how, how game play is, is done but i'm assuming and as i say it might be a bit naive but i'm assuming that the makers of games have made these games so appealing through mm -hmm. challenges the fact that there's like very strong camaraderie you've got to rely on one another to achieve something so there has to be really strong coordination and that, absolutely that means that we've got to find mechanisms to not only work together but get through our own personal challenges and in and and that means personality you know difference absolutely and, and, you know who's going to lead who's going to follow and decision making and so on so there's quite a lot of quite a lot of cooperation required that mm -hmm. I suppose it's being practiced and and, and reinforced uh, and there's a game reinforcing when you do it well you win exactly so, exactly you know it's not just you know being able to play in soccer and if you play together then then you kind of win you get into this at home as well um you know and many evolutions of 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 attempts you know you can kind of continue to do so mm -hmm. Um, is that what we're talking about? That that this environment is rich in a social, absolutely um, opportunity to 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 develop those skills, and obviously with your peers and like minded people and the like. Absolutely, the it is all about the interactions, um, both with friends and strangers. It can kind of, that shape essentially how you behave and how you perform and, and that's what i find really fascinating about video games and actually a lot of technology including social media it's that connectivity that if we think about historically we never had like before the telephone you know we'd interact with with mail and things like that then we had the telephone you'd only interact with friends but now we have social media where you're interacting with strangers at a scale never before seen in human history. And that connectivity is really, really interesting, and especially from an evolutionary perspective, because what it allows you to do is compare yourself to others at a scale we never have done before. And what I mean by that is if we think about hunter-gatherers or individuals, even, even a few centuries ago, the people that we'd interact with were the people in our town. Uh, and those are the people that we knew Nowadays, I can interact with people in Canada and the US and Europe and South America extremely easily. So uh, I can compare myself to those individuals as well. Mm -hmm. I see what people are doing. I see how they're succeeding. I want to succeed. I want that status. So it's always uh, taking in information from the internet or from digital interactions and trying to figure out what we can do to potentially increase our own status as well. And one thing I, I want to talk about really quickly is, is this idea of status, because I think it really sets up a lot of what we're going to talk about in a bit. When I talk about fitness and evolution, it's all about the number of offspring that individuals leave behind in the next generation, both the number and their quality. For humans, there's very little variation in the number of offspring we end up usually having. It's so on average about two offspring. So there's not, because there's not that much average in the number of the offspring we leave behind, there is often a lot of variation in the quality of offspring or the resources that those offspring have. And that access to resources can result in different developmental pathways and, and different benefits 
for those individuals. So when I talk about status in humans, status is a really important thing because status allows you to gain access to resources or people that lower status individuals may not have access to. And to me, that plays a really, really important role in understanding human behavior. And that ties nicely into the conversations we're going to have about technology and video games. So status is is somewhat the the moderating factor that actually equals access to resources, at, at least on an average um, basis. Absolutely. Um, you know, females are looking for higher status males. Exactly. To um, uh, procreate with. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, likewise, I'm assuming men do the same. Um, Absolutely. It's the highest opportunity for, you know, success and and success i suppose in the western world is uh usually gauged as financial but there's mm -hmm. a flow-on effect that means you know absolutely, absolutely more variation more resources more opportunities uh, and the idea is that has a a, a, a evolutionary um uh, benefit absolutely that's exactly it that's exactly it. Uh, we see that kind of variation in society all the time as individuals vary in, in wealth, for example, which is an important resource because that gives you access to vehicles, transport, variation in schooling, for example. You can live in different neighborhoods and all those things uh, are associated essentially with an individual status. Mm -hmm. And so how, how does status begin to evolve in the gaming uh, uh, space uh, you know what mm -hmm. are the, the functions here i mean i if, if we're not talking about gaming i would think about how status starts to evolve in primary school you know and, mm -hmm. and you know there, there, there's always a question of you know Who's the tallest or who's the fastest? Absolutely. Who's the most academic? It depends what world, I suppose, depends what is important in your social it, it, network. Absolutely. What status means. Because mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously, uh, well, you know, if I speak for myself, I did, certainly didn't want to be a nerd. That's probably <laughs> because I wasn't particularly academically minded at that time. But yep. I definitely wanted to be, you know, perform well in sport. Uh, and that was kind of my status, you know, yeah. a position. Could I do some sort of sport well? Um, and and obviously that evolves. You, you know, you change your status through throughout time. Um, Absolutely. But uh, maybe you can talk through some of the the, the functions and how status evolves and <clears throat> what that looks like. Um, and and what are the important time frames that status? Um, or is it kind of just throughout the entire lifetime? Yeah. So. So if we think about non-human animals for a second, um, they also have a, a similar thing like status, but it's associated with how big they are, how strong they are, how well they compete. But essentially, it ends up creating some kind of a hierarchy between individuals. And individuals can probe that hierarchy by having interactions with one another. You can choose to fight an individual. If you end up losing that fight, you know that you're below that individual in the hierarchy. Uh, if you end up winning that fight, you know you're above that individual in hierarchy. And we see hierarchies existing in a lot of different non-human animals, uh, our closest relatives in primates, non-human primates. You know, we see that really commonly as well. If we think about it in humans, that also exists. We also have a hierarchy in some way, and it is associated with status. It can it can be associated with wealth. But it, let's let's jump back into little kids for a second because I love that idea that you brought up, and I'm gonna bring an example from my kids a little bit. When they were kindergarten and year one, what could kids possibly be comparing themselves about in status? We could think like what that can't possibly be important to them. But I don't. If your kids were similar to mine, they probably went to school with Pokemon cards, right? And different kids have different numbers of cards not only different numbers of cards but they also have cards that may be of greater or lesser value than others for example a pikachu may be important uh, uh, maybe less important than a raichu for example but the possession of that gives that individual some level of status wow i can't believe you have that card that's amazing and by doing that 
other people around you may have a different perspective about you. Wow, that person's really great. They have that card. I'm jealous of them, but I want to also hang around with them a little bit more because, hey, maybe they might give me that card or they may tell me where to get that card from. So even at a really young age, we tend to compare ourselves with others. We just can't help it. It's what all animals do. When we get older, that comparison may be made on the car that we drive or the house that we have or the clothes that we wear or the beauty products that we use. And you can see that a lot of the things that we have around us uh, in consumer culture is in in some way associated with status. Um, you being able to afford or have certain things and others not may provide you with greater status in, in your environment and may give you access to different resources or different opportunities. And that's where it gets really interesting. It, it, it's so interesting because a lot of these things, uh, status comes from the possession of something yes. that others might not be able to. And so, uh, you know, Having really high status means you've got, as an adult, potentially uh, mm -hmm. the potential of having better access to health care. Uh, Absolutely. As a young person, it might be that you have a rare card, either through luck um, or yep. you, you've just purchased so many cards because mum and dad had the resources that, that the exactly. uh, probability was you'd have a rarer card. but. That was completely made up, you know. It's, no, Absolutely, we, we just kind of find a a measuring stick and say this one's rare. We will we will create one in ten thousand cards will be this, and that creates absolutely status. And and you know, from an, an adult level, you know, who wants to pay for a hundred eighty dollar shirt? Um, there's kind of a status for that versus someone who is willing to pay thirty dollars for a shirt. And there's an understanding exactly. that you can pay one hundred and eighty dollars. You're probably well off enough, and so uh, uh, there's there's kind of a a, a, a genuine understanding that it, it plays out that way because you you know someone who can't afford it might be able to buy one shirt. Uh, exactly, probably going to struggle buying another one and another one when it is <laughs> out versus someone who actually has that volume. You know, three thousand dollar suit uh, that I need to blink at, and and uh, but we always have to show a symbol, you know, <laughs> exactly a symbol to signify this has come from boss or something. This is probably showing that's me. exactly. I don't it. know who the who the good clothing <laughs> brands are, but uh, Gucci and so on. Uh, you've got to demonstrate that that's uh, not accessible to everybody. Exactly. Yeah. And if we take that idea and we slide it along into video games, which is how we started this conversation, video games do a really good job of telling you where you sit in the hierarchy and yeah. your status. Not only do we have levels to tell you how, what level you are and, and, and where you are relative to others, we have different... Uh, Outfits and clothing options, which may require you to buy different passes to gain access to you. Performance within a video game can tell you how good you are and where you sit in the hierarchy. There's all this information in video games that tells the player where they sit within a hierarchy and what their status is. And Michael, I've that had, I've, I've just yeah. felt a. Uh, uh, an intellectual slap across the face, but which I, I have not considered that component of, of how much that mimics just human life. Mm -hmm. the, the, that every article of clothing, absolutely, the power that you have, or what the level is, or if you've been able to change the color of your hair. I mean, exactly does it as well. You know how many absolutely you've got if you're in recruit course. Yeah, you know, it, it might be about which color shirt. And if you're, you know, becoming a bit more senior, they give you a different color shirt or whatever nonsense that we make up. But it's exactly to everyone, they're senior. They they they're yes. above us. Um, and gaming is uh, absolutely gamified. So it makes it interesting. But it, absolutely but it blows that. Um, Wow, it blows that up. Um, I yeah. have no idea whatsoever. That's just been a big, uh, <laughs> big. Uh, I'm so glad of 
how much that replicate or reinforces uh, why people work so hard at it and yes. the importance of status as, as well. Exactly. So to give you an idea, there's a new game that's just come out called Pal World, which they uh, the makers are touting as a game of Pokemon with guns, for example. And everyone's been playing it like crazy. But just this morning, someone's just come out with... Uh, a, a Pokedex-like object. And what that is, is it describes all the different creatures that you can catch within the game. Ugh. So here's this individual who's played this game so much that they've created a list of all the characters. Now that has a lot of status because this individual is now the first person to develop this and everyone's going to be using it. So... Wow, right? You can see how a simple little game can now offer an opportunity to an individual to gain status in a world that they feel very comfortable in. And this really stems back to that, that concept you talked about earlier, the different things that interest us. We may be interested in collecting old records. We may be interested in video games or old cars, but those worlds that we enter provide a way for us or a yardstick, like you mentioned, to measure ourselves against other people in that world. My friend collects rare 1950s punk records. One year, he was really lucky in the Blue Mountains and found a super rare record. And this was about 10 years ago. People in Sydney still talk about the record that he found at that period of time, right? So that little thing provides people with status because it allows them to understand, wow, he must be really good at finding records if he found that one at that time. So whatever we're interested in, there is always that thing that yeah. pulls us in and allows us to measure ourselves against others. I know I've, I've in the last uh, several years, uh, uh, leaned into or, or found myself in the uh, four-wheel driving world. And right. So Any time I hear that someone's gone out and done, you know, Cape York. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, Mount Pinabar, which is a bit more local. Yep. I, I, I'm attracted to wanting to find out from them because, you know, they've got all the experience. You know? Right. If I get one of those tracks done, I, I'm like, yeah, you know, I've, I've done Mount Pinabar. Exactly. It kind of feels good. It means nothing at all. But, <laughs> uh, but, but it does like, to you. It does to me. And if I meet yeah. someone who's also done that mountain or that track, you've got something shared in common. And, and, exactly, and all of a sudden right? you that there, there's a mutual respect, you know, we've trodden on the same path. We kind of exactly know what each other has done as a commonality. Um, and and I suppose when you like someone, uh, that's a safer environment. They're not going to be a threat. Exactly. Someone. You know, you you've kind of united where now the you know, four-wheel drive crew, so yep. to speak. Um, so we we're bonded. Absolutely. And I, I, what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, I'd like to focus in a little bit about the idea of how you felt when when you did do that track, right? It makes you feel good about yourself, right? Oh, it, 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 it's interesting. I, I did one very particular track and it was on my you know, so-called uh, inverted um, uh, commas. Um, that was on my bucket list and, and yeah. it was such a significant track. I felt like I was one of few people who, right. and in many ways, it's a very rare track to because to, to 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 go through because you could damage your vehicle quite considerably. Right, and I felt um, I actually felt elated. I I was, and I did it with you know uh, a small group of friends, and we embraced. You know, we we you know. Uh, uh, shook hands or high fived and hugged each other, and we kind of screamed a bit. And you know, we we're, were yeah. like this, this very masculine sort of beating out, sure. us, but but kind of like we we accomplished something. We won the battle against this this truck. absolutely uh, so ridiculous when you look at it. But uh, it was such a beautiful moment. You know, we we for sure. It. You know, that would be like you know beating the boss at the end of a of, of a of a level that's you know, we yes him. yes we, we killed him you know um, absolutely yes yeah, so it, it was elation it was elation and and that's what i i love about 
the idea of status because what we have is your actual status what other people see you as and then you have your own self-perceived status which i think is really really important and your self-perceived status ends up increasing when you have some kind of a win like that right you do something really well you finish that track and you like you said you're giving your friends high fives wow i must be really good to be able to finish this i feel really good about myself and you may kind of push yourself up in that hierarchy a little bit because of that success that you just had. And like you said, that's the exact same thing in a video game. You beat that boss, or let's say you're playing Fortnite a lot and you beat a bunch of players who are much higher ranked than you. Oh, wow. You would feel really good about yourself. Mm -hmm. Say, yes, all that practice has come through. I'm better than I thought. I deserve to be up in the upper echelons of this. I'm doing really well. But then what's really interesting from a research perspective is because you have that actual status and you have that self-perceived status. And those are two different things. And what I'm really interested in understanding is how is our self-perceived status? How does that affect our behavior? And does that affect change based on how our self-perceived status varies from our actual status? And let me give you a little bit of an example, just really quickly. And we can delve into it a little please, bit more deeply. Please. If I think I'm a pretty good basketball player, for example, like I've played a lot. I'm re I'm happy with myself. I think I'm pretty good. And I go out and I play a game, a pickup game with some folks at the court. And one of two things can happen, right? I do really, really well. And I blow them out of the water, Right. Uh, the other option is I do really poorly and they're all better than me. So now if I go in there thinking I'm really good and I win that game and I do really well, then it's like reinforces that idea of how good I am. And that makes me feel good. If I go out there and I do really badly, but I thought I was really good, that suggests I'm not as good as I thought I was. Well, that makes me feel pretty bad about myself. And I I want to increase my status again. So how do I how do I increase my status at that point? Well, I either practice more or I play again. But regardless, it's now what I'm doing is I'm using my self perceived status to probe my actual status in that world that I'm in to gain an understanding of where I sit in that hierarchy. And if I don't sit as high as I do, that makes me feel really bad. And I need to figure out what to do about that. So that could change how I feel about myself, how I behave towards others. And essentially, it's, it's kind of self-esteem, mm -hmm. right? Our self-esteem about ourselves changes. And that makes us really wonder, oh, do I deserve those things? Uh, you know, where do I fit? I'm not sure if I should be playing anymore. And we can make different decisions through our lives. Video games allow us to do that in a really, really interesting way because we can start manipulating. Well, one thing we can do is we can observe how people do in, a, in under normal circumstances, and we can see what explains that behavior, or we can manipulate people's performance or their perception of their performance, and we can see what they do afterwards. And that's what I've done in a series of different experiments, which I think are very, very fun to kind of explore. Uh, I'd love to. I'd love to hear about <laughs> it because uh, uh, I, I, I know just you know. The the moderating effect of if there's a discrepancy between your self perceived status versus actual status, mm -hmm. the different personalities. One could feel quite down, another will be quite strongly motivated to 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 say you know I need to improve. They'd probably still mm -hmm. feel down because they're quite disappointed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the discrepancy is 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 high versus someone when when they're told that they're brilliant and they thought they were brilliant. Um, yes, uh, you know, that can obviously inflate things e e even more. Um, and sometimes that's great because obviously greater confidence, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but it can obviously also, um, maybe potentially blind people. Um, so kind of like Absolutely. That of, of having yes men around someone who's powerful. Exactly. They're always right. They're always brilliant, you know, while the, they're steering the, you know, ship into an iceberg, so to speak. Um, yes. But, uh, exactly. yeah, tell, tell me more, tell me more. So I'm going to, I'm going to play a little bit more with, with that, um, that basketball analogy that I had, like, imagine I was going out 
into that game and everybody was taller than me. Well, I kind of, even though I'm really good, I might think, oh, this is going to be a tough game. So if I end up losing it, I don't feel so bad. Um, but what if I played with a bunch of folks that were all shorter than me? Well, I would walk into that situation. I would probably think I'm going to win in this circumstance. I'm going to do really, really well. But if I lose, that can potentially give me a really bad feeling about myself. So mm. bad that I could potentially be aggressive to those individuals if I feel that I'm tougher than them, right? And real world aggression is a tough thing and a dangerous thing because it can lead to somebody getting hurt. There's a lot of risk associated with real world aggression. That's not the case with online aggression. Online aggression is largely risk-free. You're not going to get punched in the face when you're an anonymous person online. You might get yelled at again, but there's very little risk. So online interactions are interesting because they allow people, or I see them as interesting, is because they allow people to probe their status and their position in a hierarchy in largely a risk-free environment. Sure. And, that, and video games are a perfect venue to kind of explore that. And that's what that was actually my first foray into video game research. There was a fellow named Jeff Kuznikov in the US who did a phenomenal research study where he played during his PhD about 500 games of Halo. For those who don't know what Halo is, it's a first person shooter that was really popular um, in the early 2000s, for example. So he played about 500 games. What made his research interesting is. He played the games in one of three ways. He was he either played and didn't speak at all, and that was the control situation, or he played and he used a recording of a, of a male or of a masculine voice within the game. Or he played and he used a recording of a female or feminine voice within his game. So what I'm going to... The results I'm going to talk to about right now are very sex specific. And what I mean about that is I'm going to be talking about male voices and female voices with the assumption that they were men and women. Because at that period of time, there was no ability to moderate voices online. Uh, and it was largely men who were living or playing within that gaming sphere. That's since changed dramatically. We have a, a lot of women and a lot of gender diverse individuals playing video games. But I'm going to talk about this really interesting period of time where women largely weren't welcome in male spheres online because it was considered a very masculine or male thing to do was to play these violent um, competitive video games. So what's an interesting thing about Jeff's study is now he played these games as a man or as a woman. And he was able to record his performance, other players' performances within the game from his teammates and opponents. And he could also record the number of positive and negative comments he received from his teammates. And that's what I found really, really fascinating about his study. What he essentially found is, regardless of whether he played as a man or a woman in this game, uh, his teammates were largely equally positive to him. But when he played as a woman within the game, his teammates were much more negative towards him compared to when he played as a man in the game. And that's a really, really interesting thing because if we think about it, here's this person coming into an online game as a man. He does well. Other men congratulate him this camaraderie we speak of often in, in male dominated environments. If he doesn't do well, that's okay, but you don't speak up to the men who did well. It's that very strong hierarchy in that environment, right? So you don't get those negative comments. When Jeff went in there as a woman and he did well, he would get many negative comments from his competitors. Wow. which is really, really similar to what we see in male-dominated environments in human society when women enter those. So I, I was really fascinated by that. And I reached out to him. I said, Jeff, this is incredible. These are amazing data. Have you looked at 
who is behaving in that positive and negative way in those environments. He said, I'd love to, but I don't have the time. And that's where he was kind enough to share his data. And we worked together. And this was, like I said, our first foray. And to kind of uh, give you the ending really quick, because I know we'll have lots of more discussions about this. We found that it's the men who perform really well were positive both, both towards men and women. So they were supportive to everybody. And the argument here is these are men performing well. They know their position and the status. They have no risk of losing that position. Sure. So they're kind to everybody. But those men who are underperforming, when they're in a male environment, they're not negative because we do have that hierarchy that stops men from being negative toward somebody above them because there's always a risk of a challenge there and you sure. don't want to lose that challenge. But if you are outcompeted by a woman, that could be considered particularly damaging to a young man because that shifts him down that hierarchy. Sure. Not only down in that hierarchy, in a male hierarchy, but now there's the potential that that man is below a woman in the hierarchy. And if we think about very traditional masculinity and we think about hierarchies in men and women separately, that's a negative thing. And we can see why those young men who don't do well and are outcompeted by people they think they should outcompete or be able to outcompete, they're particularly negative, especially mm -hmm. toward those individuals who move them down those ranks. It's interesting because the moment that risk is in play mm -hmm. of shifting your hierarchy immediately is 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 a moderating factor or, or challenges that status and, and therefore exactly. there is a likelihood of of uh uh that negativity coming through but it's interesting absolutely that if someone perceives their status as being greater because they're a man versus a woman, they're more likely to to, to say something yes. negative. But mm -hmm. if they perceive their status as being uh, uh, equal, because it's because of the forcing function of being both men, they're mm -hmm. less likely to say as much because it could create a challenge. Um, exactly. Uh, and obviously, just to summarize, the first part is if your status is not being challenged because you are at the higher uh, highest. Um, in actual fact, you are polite, you know, and, and, and kind and supportive either way. Absolutely. Um, probably elevates you again um, because not exactly. only are you fantastic in this game, but you're also really nice and supportive and encouraging. Um, and yes. That, and obviously, that's because you've got no risk. Your society that's exactly it. Great. Uh, so society becomes more um, uh, uh, kind to each other when the opportunity is is is, is provided and, and status is shared. Exactly. And I think that, that this study um, can teach us a lot about human behavior and also help explain what we often see in male biased environments is that sexism that we see in society. Um, there's that risk of losing status. So men, the best way to ensure you don't lose status to a woman in a male dominant environment is to ensure that a woman is unwelcome there. Right. And we can extrapolate that kind of idea to everybody who's different to us as well. Right. Especially if we feel, if we may feel superior to other individuals. So that especially kind of study to Michael, me. My, my apologies yeah. for jumping, especially no, of course. in the context that you're talking about it, which is when there's a very strongly held identity. And mm -hmm. that strongly held identity is all being male. You know, we saw exactly some politics not long ago with Julia Gillard coming yes. to a very male-dominated area. Um, and Absolutely, all things occurred there. Exactly. Um, having said that, if we went back twenty years ago, and you saw the uh, uh, military facility that I was uh, partaking in, and and we were all learning to be mechanics, mm -hmm. a small handful of, of, of females. Um, you know, they got ridicule, uh, yeah. um, because they were different. Um, exactly. Uh, and, you know, we came up with our own stories as to why they're not as competent and all this other nonsense. Absolutely. Uh, uh, but, uh, that was because there's a very strongly defined 
identity, you know, and, and therefore that hierarchy exactly. is based on that one thing. And this this is a novel entry, you know, like a, a female playing ha- Halo. Halo is that correct? Yeah, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. A female playing the, the the game Halo is 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 ridiculous. You know, they don't belong. Yes, to, uh, exactly. And my God, if they beat me, that's that that's shocking. You know, I'm absolutely I'm beaten by a female. What does that mean about yes my status? You know, it makes me sink. So let's bring her down. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, and this is why I think video games are such a really neat way to be able to explore human behavior and dissect some of these things because you can't, or it's really hard or difficult to to manipulate things uh, in our environment. But in that digital world, it's so easy to manipulate a lot of things. Now, now imagine if we can go back into that game and manipulate how an individual perceives themselves. Maybe they're doing well in a game, but we, we, push them further down into the leaderboard so when they compare themselves there's oh i'm good but actually i'm not as good as i thought i was right or oh, i'm good and i'm better than i thought i was so by manipulating people's self-perception of their own ability or performance we can then see how that ends up moderating how they behave in the future and then that gives a little more information with human behavior. Maybe we can solve some of these problems that we see in society that we deem negative. I'm I'm assuming that's the next part of the research. That, that uh... <laughs> there is a little bit coming up, and and, and that does I it's did lead it in there. Yes, where you're bringing people down just to watch them, <laughs> um, but probably it is quite, quite it is as well. You know, you're, it is you're amazing no what you can in do the, uh, in the top. Quadrant, uh, yes. we're bringing you down to the center. <laughs> Let's see how you behave uh, now. Yes, yes. So, and, and it is fun. It is fun. The things that you can do uh, in studies when you think about uh, how to manipulate things is, is quite fun. Um, my colleague and I, Tom Denson, and I, I had a, a really fun study um, where we had a bunch of folks come in and play a virtual reality game. And we looked at their performance, um, and then we took them back and we asked them to look at a bunch of images and rate the uh, the strength or the status of those individuals. So we actually had, when they played these VR games, we had them play either a aggressive competitive game or a more relaxed puzzle style of game. Mm -hmm. And what we actually found was those individuals that ended up playing those more aggressive violent games ended up rating, rating other people's physical formidability as lower. So when they play that violent game, they thought better of themselves. They felt tougher. And when they were forced to look at other individuals of tough individuals, they rated those individuals as less tough. Mm -hmm. So by perceiving ourselves as stronger and better, it changes our perception of other individuals around us. Yes. Uh, And that's an important thing to understand because that obviously will end up changing our behavior towards other people as well. So it's really interesting to be able to tease those kinds of things apart. Because this is also just purely happening on a perceived, self-perceived status. So when you, by exactly. that, just playing this particular game, brings you up, you know, that the, uh, and you don't have to perform well. It's just this group against that group. Exactly. That's exactly comparative it. Comparative to that group, yeah. We've got um we've got another wonderful study uh, currently in review, which I'm really excited about. Where this, this time we did something a little bit different. We brought students into a room and we said, "Listen, we are trying to understand what young people are looking for uh, in a potential mate." So these were all heterosexual individuals that we brought in, just to let you know. And what we told them was, "All right, you're going to meet another individual." Uh, through a computer screen, because we're trying to understand how individuals are getting to know each other on online dating opportunities. And let's say uh, a, a guy walks in, we sit him down, we tell him, you're going to meet a young girl. 
you're going to get an opportunity to tell them what you're interested in a partner. They're going to tell you what they're interested in a partner. Then they're going to go away and meet another guy and do the same thing. Then they get a chance to choose who they're going to go on a coffee date with and we'll pay for that coffee date. And we did the exact same study for young women as well, where they meet a young man and that man will have a choice between them or someone else. But of course, the one thing we don't tell them is that person they're meeting is actually just a video recording. We make it look very real and the person, the actor is nodding their head and talking at the right times, but it's not a real person that they're going to have a date with. But what we do do is after the trial, we hand over an envelope to our participant. And in that envelope, it says, yes, I would like to go on a coffee date with you. Or no, I don't want to go on a coffee date with you. Thank you very much. So you can imagine that that individual now feels excited or elated for getting that coffee date or a little bit sad that they lost out. And this is where the experiment really begins. That's just a manipulation. Before they leave, we ask them, just before you go, um, we're actually preparing another study that we're going to start in the next month or so, but we're, we're, I, we need a little bit of your help to tell us, you know, how that, what we should do in that study. Here are six games that we are potentially going to play with our participants. Which one would you like to play right now? And within that selection of games are three violent games and three nonviolent games. And then we can look at what do these people who did get the coffee date or didn't get the coffee date choose to play. And what we find is men that end up losing that coffee date are more likely to select a violent video game to play than men who won that coffee date. And our argument there was, well, I've just lost status in a mating interaction by being declined a mating opportunity. So I may I may think about myself as a little bit lower status. So how do I regain some of that status and make myself feel better about things? Well, I can play a violent video game and maybe kick some butt online and that will make me feel a little bit better about myself. And that's kind of what we ended up seeing happening there. So we can see that even real life interactions have the possibility of, of affecting our behavior and our choices later on. And we may choose to seek out opportunities to increase our status if we have a negative interaction. Mm. It's so interesting because status can even be considered as, as a capacity of power or control. Absolutely. And even a small thing like being rude or mm -hmm. being dismissive, uh, you know, being agitated, angry, still brings about a level of dominance, um, you know, which, yeah. which kind of says at least in this interaction, uh, you know, no one's going to mess with me. I am stronger. Yes. You know, I can be rude to someone. Um, and, and, you know, if I get denied a mating opportunity, disappointment, uh, I'll take mm -hmm. it out on the next person i'm a bit more dysregulated potentially um mm -hmm. uh, but a mechanism that comes out from that is is just being short with others and and yeah uh and yeah so fascinating and obviously preferences it just shows our behaviors that we then just lean into what we're feeling um you know something that as you say potentially the hypothesis of bringing yourself up <clears throat> from mm -hmm. a status or leaning into the feeling that you've got um, but it's it's definitely moderating uh, at least the choice in in, in that absolutely moment. Wow, wow. Yeah, it's just you know, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you know, five minute conversation, and then you get the news that no, they're not that interested in having a coffee. Uh, yes, yes. Like oh, you know, I thought we had something happening. Yes, it was exactly, nice. exactly. Like, said all the right things, didn't I? Yes, absolutely. What was the same true for the women? Uh, Interestingly, no. So we didn't see that. Um, I'd love to do this study on a larger scale. Um, because what the one thing that we do see with uh, um, 
psychology students is you do see much more traditional kind of gender roles with some of the psychology students coming through, especially sure. when you're only working um, with heterosexual students, right? So in this case, what we have is a lot of men who traditionally play more video games than women who uh, in, in psychology students, at least anyway. So what I'd love to be able to do is replicate this study on a broader population of individuals where men and women play violent video games. And I would hypothesize that we'd end up seeing a very similar thing in women because a lot of our other research shows that men and women do behave very, very similarly in response to um, status and changes in status uh, when it comes to video games. So when we're using a much larger general population, we do see very, very similar behavior in men and women, uh, which to me is much more interesting because I think men and women are much more similar than mm, mm. a lot of the literature talks about because we're always fascinated with differences but i think those similarities to me are much much more interesting yeah. and it's interesting potentially even uh, looking at what games were provided in that uh there could very mm -hmm. much be a status component and i'm assuming that's what we're absolutely saying, a status component in these violent games yes uh, so that you're immediately going back into the where am i where, where do I hold status? Uh, yes. Versus in a world where, you know, maybe my status is, you know, I, I don't identify with that. It doesn't really make much of a difference. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, th that that's interesting that, that you know, mm -hmm. we might be leaning into where am I already good? I need to compensate. I need to get my, yes. you know, my, my ego has been wounded. Where can Absolutely. I go and, uh, you know, recharge? Where am I good? Exactly. Exactly. So that's that whole idea of what you just talked about right there is something that uh, Tom and Eddie and I have put together in a formalized model that has the potential to help explain why some individuals are more drawn to playing violent video games and why individuals can become addicted to playing video games. Like, and it really comes back to the, what you talked about earlier on. We know a lot of game developers are using a lot of psychological tricks or to be able to manipulate how people play and how often they play. And this comes right back into it. You can imagine if you are not sure about your status as a young individual, they say a teenager, then video games offer a really interesting way to probe that status, like we've talked about. It's low cost. You really get a lot of information. You can practice. You can see changes in your performance. And it really allows you to understand where you sit in that hierarchy. As you play and you get that positive reinforcement, that could lead you to want to play more, mm -hmm. especially if there's a misalignment in your perceived status and your actual status. You may want to increase your perceived status and your actual status so you're, you're driving that up. So your desire to keep replaying and replaying games. And problematic gaming may happen when you're never happy with your status and you need it to increase all the time. So you need to come back to that because that playing feeds back into your self-perceived status and makes you feel better. And that can be a, a really negative kind of loop. So we're tackling that more from an evolutionary perspective rather than uh, a cognitive deficiency kind of perspective where individuals may be... Um, limited or desire some more dopamine hits we're giving that kind of an evolutionary understanding of status to why people are driven to that it's so incredible though how how strongly wired that yes. status component is and, yeah. and these examples and research that you've provided you know stemming all the way from you know if, if, if we go back to just looking at how evolution plays with with mm -hmm. redbacks through to how we game yeah we do this in you know decision making mm -hmm. uh, uh, how we potentially treat others depending on that that moderator of, of perceived status versus actual mm -hmm. um you know status uh, and and also where we therefore lean into more like we've all had the experience of saying 
I enjoyed these subjects at school. Absolutely. You know, and, and there's no um, uh, surprise that the grades on average, I, I assume at least, would have to be much greater than the subjects that you didn't enjoy. Uh, Absolutely. You had a greater status in that as well, not only enjoyed it, but yes. formed better, which, you know, is is a reinforcing loop. And, and all of a sudden you are you know, awarded more with whether it's praise exactly. from the teacher or from your your uh, peers in the heart of the exactly you know, um the the, the 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 better and hence why we're often very much uh, inspired by those who don't require that praise that they're self uh, yes um, driven uh, and yes so even if they have 25 failures in front of them they keep pushing for their own cause. Uh, yes, uh, which, you know, and in some sense, that status within within themselves, um, they're, they're not looking absolutely for external status. They're, they're saying, if I do this another thousand times, if I fail another hundred times, it, it it means I am more, I am uh, better. You know, I, I can yes. do more. And I, I find that idea really fascinating. That's something that I haven't had a chance to look at, but. I, in a way, what you're getting at is resilience, right? Sure. The the idea that I can take that loss, I'm okay with that loss. I know I'm better than that, and I know sometimes losses do happen. That's okay. I'm going to get back on that horse and do that again. So I really do have this feeling that it has something to do with our self perceived status and our kind of acceptance of where we actually sit in our hierarchy. So. If we jump back to those those guys who are negative, or sorry, guys who are positive to women uh, in that gaming experiment that I ended up talking about earlier, we could say, well, those individuals are really high status. Uh, so, of course, they're going to behave positively because there's no risk of losing status in the situation. The other way to look at it is, well, what happens if a player, that woman, was actually better than them? One of two things will happen, right? Well, now that they do feel that challenge, do they become aggressive because they have that opportunity to lose that status? Sure. Or are these individuals who are so high status and maybe have been there for so long, they are aware of their own status. So losses don't necessarily affect them as mm -hmm. much or they're more resilient to them. So maybe losing to a woman at that point isn't as damaging because that's okay. I know how good I am. This person is just better than me and I'm okay with that. So we accept ourselves or our self-perceived status and our actual status align in such a way that we're happy where we are. And that's also part of that model that we've put together. Mm. Maybe people play less video games or become less addicted to something because they're happy within their position within that hierarchy and those external factors don't moderate their self-perceived status as much any longer so they don't change their behavior in response to those things but i I'm have to still test that yeah yeah <laughs> i'm wondering whether that's maybe also a function that is occurring for uh people who are of older age absolutely that uh, mm -hmm. and I only say this antidotally, but it's certainly been my experience, and I believe others have, have felt the same. That you know, older people tend to be much more courteous and polite yes. and um, accommodating and patient. They're they're not necessarily fighting for status. Um, you know, they found Absolutely. a position of acceptance. Um, that's at least been my. Uh, experience and, and and they've also procreated you know they exactly they more often than not absolutely children and grandkids and their values are around family and community uh, so we don't yes. see much hustle and bustle um and exactly. you know, probably yeah. genetically you don't have the power you know you, you're not yes. about to go out and strike out at someone because yes physical altercation could mean death you know absolutely um, serious injury um uh, so I'm wondering whether that is is you know a a, a part of that um, or explains a part of that or whether it's just antidotal. Yeah, so it's it's tough to say because as, as you just said, it's experience, right? And it's hard to tease apart age and experience. 
uh, with older people, right? So, but we could do this in video games. This is something that I like to do. Could we look at individuals with approximately the same age or have been playing a similar game for the same period of time, but one has played more than the other? And those individuals who've had more experience in that game should arguably think in that way. Oh, that loss or that win doesn't affect me as much, so yeah. I'm okay with that. And that's something that I'd like to explore in the future yeah. to be able to see if that's actually the case. Yeah, because either they've accommodated or or, or, or acclimatized to a loss yes. meaning so much, uh, exactly, or they've accepted, "Hey, I'm going to maintain this status. I'm not going up or down too much. I've, you know, it's kind of like golf. Yeah, um, I've got this many strokes. Yes. I'm not going to improve." Yeah, um, that exactly. hurts to, to get to that point. Um, or you get yes. that, as I have. Um, <clears throat> but it might be that a, a factor that allows uh, for that. Yes. What, what's interesting, interesting it's, it would be experience that's moderating rather than age. Um, that's exactly it. It's so important to, to um, Absolutely. prior part, distinguish between. Absolutely. Yeah. So that, that'll that be the next few years. Hopefully they'll be able to start exploring those things. But yeah, that's. Uh, I'm glad we both came up to the same hypothesis. <laughs> I could uh, I, I could see there being a thousand uh, experiments. That would yes. be so fascinating <laughs> um, to, to, to do. How do you select which one's next? Like, yes. Uh, how, how does that occur? Because I can see, you know, your passion just is oozing mm -hmm. out. You know, you're you're phenomenal in your communication, and clearly you're passionate oh, you. and methodical in, in in the way that you think. But how do you go out and say, "There's so many, so many <laughs> avenues to take. Which one am I going to do? How how does that come about?" It, it's you're right it's tough often it's tempered by what my students want to explore they are all have all these questions and they'll come in and then you know i want to make sure that they do well and they succeed so i'll help nurture some of their ideas uh and help them grow in that kind of a way and you know there's always plenty of time there's always time to do all kinds of things and and as technology changes there's so many more experiments uh that are possible uh, so sometimes some of those have to go by the wayside because there's just not enough time in the world to do everything that you want to do. But um, I'm they, they're, I'm always fascinated with status. So that's what really all my studies kind of explore nowadays. Uh, and as I bring in other collaborators, new ideas are kind of brought on to some of these experiments that I run. Yeah, it's fascinating. One question that I did want to ask mm -hmm. and alluded to it very early in our, in our conversation about uh, changes in the environment around risk mm -hmm. and uh, onset of puberty. Yes, is yes. it true? Uh, and you've 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 mentioned it in actual fact. Mm -hmm. that that's the 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 function, um, not in terms of risk, but certainly opportunity for mating. Uh, uh, is, is it moderates? You know how quickly a redback matures. Yes, uh, I heard. Uh, or read, I can't remember, I can't, you know, you, you read yes. so much and you can't recall all of this, but that in particular, um, actually, I don't, I'm not sure if whether it was females or, 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 or males, but um, those that grow up in an environment that has abuse, you know, physical mm -hmm. violence or, um, you know, neglect, scarcity, um, uh, you know, danger in, in, mm -hmm. in their life uh, have a... I suppose a significant, um, uh, significantly earlier. Now, I don't yes. know what the, the numbers are, but but uh, onset of puberty and obviously yes. the the idea there is once you go into puberty, you can procreate. The risks are high yes. of, of, of damage, of harm, of being killed. So you've got to therefore um, you know procreate, and uh, with that, I suppose comes with uh, the the factor of. Um, being explorative in in sexual um, encounters mm -hmm. because you know there, there must be some sort of function that's saying I need to you know start being sexual uh, yeah even yeah. though you know uh, we would argue someone would be incredibly young is that a true phenomena for humans it is so a lot of the as you can imagine a lot of the d data or the studies explore young girls for obvious reason it's 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 really simple to identify 
when they become an adult or when they reach menarche, right? Uh, with boys, when they hit puberty, that is not as quick or there isn't a certain period in time that's super noticeable that identifies, yes, now you are an adult. You know, boys grow hair and things like that, but a young girl will have a period which will start that whole on process of becoming an adult. So there's already a bias in the literature of who can explore because it's young girls or women will obviously re remember when they had their first period boys that's a lot more difficult if i think back i cannot remember when i hit puberty it was somewhere in high school i don't even know the the year never mind the date but it's a much more common thing for for women to remember for obvious re reasons so I'll, right away you'll have a bias in the data that we can start exploring right that's why but, i was saying i'm not sure whether it's re relative yeah. to, 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 to females and males as well yeah. but I think I heard it in the context of females, but I, I, I yeah. wasn't quite sure. That was vague as well. And and I, I do vaguely remember this study that you, you speak of, that young girls who are in a home uh, with a man that is not their father, like a stepfather example or a new boyfriend, do end up reaching menarche before young girls who are in a home with their father. Again, of course, there's going to be a lot of factors that are going to lead to variation in those kinds of things. But it's fascinating that something like that has a potential to modify things. And the argument there is, well, if if uh, a young girl reaches puberty earlier in an environment with a potentially dangerous man in there, there's a way to solve that problem or lower the risk, and that is to become sexually mature. So... That's a tough, really tough question to kind of explore because as you can imagine, the data are really hard to collect on something yeah. like that. Uh, there are very few data sets that allow you to explore that question really, really well. So replicating that is also very, very difficult. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. So I, I was always really, really interested in exploring that fact to see if the social environment can influence things like that. And imagine if we can explore that question in... And girls that go into all girls schools versus schools, co-ed schools, maybe we'd see some kind of variation in something like that. But I've never been able to get my hands on, on data to be able to explore questions like that. Mm. That being said, I wouldn't be surprised if the social environment could have such an influence on humans. We're animals just like everybody else. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. Mm -hmm. No, it makes, makes sense. What is your current research what are you working on uh, at the moment yeah so i'm i'm really fascinated with technology with where technology has gone over the last year if we think about ai and, and what that's doing uh how that's changing work and life and social interactions it's a massive massive change to us so i'm really really fascinated with how ai has the potential to influence our social interactions and our expectation of those social interactions. Say, for example, if chatbots are really polite or really uh, negative towards us, that may change how we behave towards others. So I'm really fascinated with that kind of question and I'm exploring those kinds of things. But I'm also really, really interested in, in video games and what they could potentially do to improve uh, society. And one of the things that I've done over the past eight years is I've started a small company called Arludo. And within that company, we create games to help teachers teach kids science. So they're mobile games that allow students to experience different worlds that we've created. Like, for example, they're a lizard on an island and they have to survive for as long as they can. And they have to moderate, moderate their behavior in basking and feeding and stay away from predators. So in that way, as we turn them into lizards, they learn more about the environment. But then we also collect all those data that they end up collecting through the game, what they ate, when they ate, how often they were attacked, how much time they spent basking, and we create graphs and figures for them. And in this way, we're helping them become scientists. And that's what I think is really fascinating about video games as well. They allow you to experience things in a safe environment, just like we've mm -hmm. talked about. And here's this opportunity for students to become lizards or to become scientists in a digital environment where we reduce those risks of failure 
to improve students' confidence about science and about their own ability to think creatively and critically. And in that way, we give them an opportunity to practice those skills. So hopefully that they can increase their confidence. And that's what I think is really, really powerful about video games is you have that opportunity to change somebody's perspective about themselves to kind of help them survive in this ever-changing world that we've got happening around us right now. Yeah, wow. Well, where can where, where can listeners find out more if they want to continue this conversation? Tell me a little bit more about uh, 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 Aludo. Uh, Aludo. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, um, you've got it. T- tell me more about that. What's the website? Um, how can people yeah. get involved? Obviously, where people can find out more about you and your research. Absolutely. So you can find more on arludo.com. So it's A-R-L-U-D-O.com. And that's where we have everything for parents and for teachers to be able to engage uh, with students and or their own kids in science. So we have a lot of, last year, for example, we did a national game design challenge, which I was really excited about, where we encourage students from across Australia to work in teams to design their own science game to help kids learn more about the world around them. We had an incredible number uh, of teachers, over 500 teachers registered. We had so many different uh, proposals, shortlisted 40 of them, had 20,000 votes in two weeks, brought 10 of our top 10 teams to UNSW Sydney, where we had a huge celebration and picked a winner. And we're creating a new game we're finishing up right now called Weather or Not, that will teach kids all about physical geography and the weather and how... um, the, the geography can potentially change how uh, water is transported through the environment. Uh, so it's a really neat way to kind of get kids engaging with climate change and uh, with the environment so they can understand more about the world around them. So it was really fascinating to see how many kids, when you take out that coding aspect, how many kids are really enjoying developing games and thinking about ideas. So there's no shortage of creativity with Australian students, which I'm really, really happy to hear about. It also taps into that curiosity and, and as you say, where, where we minimize risk, where we, we yeah. don't take away the fear of, of, of uh, you know, being pushed down the ladder, but at the same time, Absolutely. a challenge. So you are pushed up the ladder that you're actually working hard to, to try and win. Yes. The, the competition in actual fact is quite, quite a large part of evolution. Right? Absolutely. It's integral to, Absolutely. to it. And, and, and that kind of taps into both, both sides. Absolutely. So, um, so aludo.com, that's fantastic. And how about yeah, thank you. For, for yourself personally, how can people get in touch or, or is it through the university? Yeah, so I'm a, an associate professor at UNSW Sydney, so I'm obviously reachable there, and I'm working with folks, uh, all kinds of students and, and faculty members there, so you can reach me uh, through UNSW Sydney. I have a website uh, that I haven't updated for a while, but it has a little bit of info of there, Um, But if you search my name, I tend to pop up uh, in news articles about video games and violence, um, so you can, uh, it's not a common name. You can easily find me if you really want to talk to me. And I'd love to talk to anybody who's interested. Michael, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure. And I certainly can say I got a lot more out of this <laughs> conversation than I expected. I, w- I was looking forward to it so much <laughs> because I love evolution. I think you've tied in, you know, the research component so much um, more than than I um <laughs> expected and, and it's so fascinating this is real life you know real world yeah applicable stuff and and even if we haven't done all the research the mm-hmm. fact that we know the mechanism at play the 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 proof of concept is there that demonstrates you know status is a moderating factor and you know absolutely there's enough in there um that can at least help all of us observe ourselves, think about our Absolutely. status, how it might you know, be reflected um, in the real world or not, uh, mm-hmm. whether it matters, you know, learning from others with experience. Hopefully the experience factor exactly. will, will be um, you know, researched in, in, in time. But there's so much to uh, continue to think about and, and uh, yeah, um, 
I, I think you're an amazing communicator as well. <laughs> thank uh, you. Thank you for, for that. We certainly need more uh, people <laughs> like yourself, not only passionate, but uh, uh, very, very um, easy to, to, to digest. And uh, oh, thank you. That's, that's, that's what's very lovely about this podcast. I, I, I enjoy um, this because we just have a, an easy conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You've done all the heavy lifting, but you can just, uh, <laughs> you know, condense it down and uh, you know uh, uh, teach people like me, um, you know, all the fascinating things that you're doing. So thank you so much. You've been incredibly uh, um, uh, uh, kind with your time and uh, thank you. Just, just thank you. No, oh, thank you so much, Nash. It was it was absolutely wonderful to be able to share my stories. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks, Margaret. All the best. All the best with the, with your next piece of research as well. <laughs> Thank you. You too. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review. Subscribe, share it via social media, and tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources. And just lastly, if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team, develop your experience and get into some exciting work, come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out. I'd love to hear from you.